Greetings everyone and welcome to our second new release Wednesday video today on Friday. It's actually Friday Night Friday now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this is late. I know I promised that I get it to you later on Wednesday, but as as Wednesday happened, uh, I worked and I've been working days and I've just been exhausted and I was just too freaking tired. So whatever. At least it's during the same week. Alrighty, so today we're going to talk about the latest DC Universe animated movie. Now this was an adaptation that a lot of us had been waiting for for a very, very long time. Because of course we had the absolutely fantastic adaptations of two of the most iconic Batman stories of the 80s, namely Batman Year One and the fantastic two-part adaptation of The Dark Knight Returns, which was no small feat. That's one of the Batman graphic novels that people said could never be adapted to the screen, but they did it, and they did a great job of it, too, I gotta say. Maybe we'll talk about that one another time. But uh, today we're here to talk about the third of what I like to call the trifecta of notable, iconic 80s Batman stories, namely... The one-shot story by Alan Moore and Brian Boland, two powerhouse talents from Britain. The Killing Joke. Yes. Now, been a bit of controversy surrounding this one. Um, yeah, so let's get right into it. The Killing Joke, today on the Multimedia Chronicles. back. All right, so just to kick things off, I just wanted to mention I've been a fan of the Killing Joke graphic novel ever since it came out. <laughs> yes, uh, for those who don't know, the original uh, printings and reprintings of this could be differentiated by the color of the text on the logo. This is actually the first printing. Yes, um, no big deal, really. It's not like I hunted it down or anything like that. I just bought it when it came out, and because I thought it looked cool, you know. And uh, I had I had actually collected the Dark Knight Returns as it came out, and it just blew me away. I'd never seen an adult Batman story like that before, and it just it just blew my, you know, barely pubescent mind. Uh, and then Batman Year One came out as kind of a follow up to it, uh, and also amazing, just blew me away. And then The Killing Joke came out, so we had another prestige format Batman story uh, coming out. Um, I was basically just grabbing all the prestige format stuff. I have you know a good chunk of them from the time. Um, Batman uh, Dark Knight Returns was kind of the first one they did in that format. It was really popular. So they did a whole DC did a whole bunch in that format, like the square bound, uh, you know, comic sized. Uh, graphic novel format. Now, um, yeah, so let me just quickly show you here. So if we uh, take a look at the inside here. There we go. First printing. Oh, yeah. So I'll just leave this out of the bag and board for now, just so we can see it in all its glory there. Uh, and also, I might want to flip through it a little bit just as we're talking. So, at long last, we have the animated adaptation. Now, there was a lot of anticipation for this because, of course, we're getting Kevin Conroy back as the voice of Batman. We've got Mark Hamill coming out of semi-retirement as the Joker to do the Joker one last time. He said that if they ever did an ad adaptation of The Killing Joke, even if he was, wasn't doing any more Joker stuff at the time, he would come back to do this one. And God bless him, he did. And uh, fantastic. I mean, th this could very well be the last time we hear Mark Hamill as the Joker. So definitely one we've all been looking forward to. And, uh, and an iconic Joker story that we've been looking forward to hearing him play the character in as the... <laughs> now, here's the thing. The graphic novel, being a one-shot prestige format edition, is only 48 pages long. It's, it's pretty short. Um, now, they could have done it as a shorter adaptation. I mean, Batman Year One was four issues originally, and they crammed it down to 62 minutes, so barely over an hour. Um, I think it, it may actually be the shortest of all the DC Universe animated movies, as far as I know. 
but uh, which I thought was kind of strange because I mean they, they, there's enough material there for a full you know 70 80 minute movie but they they did it really short but whatever I mean that that said they did a great job of it and it was it was quite a good adaptation so when they were talking about adapting the killing joke they were saying how well we want it to be feature length so we're gonna do uh, uh, a bit of an add-on story that kind of gives more background to Batgirl so that her uh, injury in in the story is more poignant and has a little more power to it because you've got more of a history with the character because you know nobody knows who batgirl is she's just a completely unfamiliar character to everyone Mm mm-hmm and this is where the controversy came in because um you know people were kind of iffy about the idea it's like well okay but I mean, this is being produced by Bruce Timm, uh, who has just a, a near flawless track record as far as adapting the DC characters for uh, animated uh, adaptations over the years, ever since Batman the Animated Series all the way up till now. And yeah, so I mean, and it was being written by Brian Azzarello, who's given us some of the great uh, modern Joker stories. And yeah, so there was, it, it seemed like everything was in good hands. And then we saw it, and, well, the fandom is very split, (laughs) shall we say, on the Batgirl story that precedes the killing joke. Now I'll just kind of give you my take on it. Take it or leave it as you will. I thought the story was very meh, to be honest. Um, In particular, the problem I had with it was it just, it was, it's very tonally different from the rest of the killing joke. I mean, the killing joke is this very dark, very psychological uh, deconstruction of what makes one go insane. <laughs> Essentially, it's it's the it's the Joker's psychological experiment uh, with Commissioner Gordon being his subject. And he's trying to drive him nuts, essentially, by by giving him a really bad day. I mean, the whole idea is that everybody is just one bad day away from insanity. So he's trying to prove a point, saying that everybody has the potential to be like me. All it all it takes is one bad day. And he, you know, he tells talks to Batman about it and says, "I can tell, I can tell that you had a bad day once." And that's what made you what you are now. You know, you're like me. I had a bad day, and that made me like this. And, and that's kind of the, 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 the basis of his, his argument, is that everyone is one bad day away from being insane. So he's trying to prove the point by just tormenting Commissioner Gordon. Now, it's a very dark, oftentimes very disturbing story. And a lot of people had issues with the main story. And I'm guessing these people weren't familiar with the comic book. Because, honestly, the part that adapts the killing joke is bang on perfect, as far as I'm concerned. It is the adaptation of the killing joke that I wanted to see. And I think they did a fantastic job of it. But the Batgirl story that precedes it... I mean, the whole reason they did the Batgirl story was because... In the killing joke itself, we don't really see Barbara Gordon as Batgirl. You don't really see her in action much. We basically just see her in a few scenes, uh, a couple scenes at the beginning, where she gets shot by the Joker, and and that's that. I mean, well, I remember when I read it when I was a kid, I didn't even realize that she was Batgirl. <laughs> that's that's how uh, obscure the, the sort of reference is. It's like, it's expected that you know who this person is. I mean, obviously, looking back, I feel like an idiot because it's like, oh, yeah, duh, Barbara, or Barbara Gordon is Commissioner Gordon's uh, daughter. And, you know, I mean, I used to watch the 60s series all the time. How did I forget that crucial piece of information in the 80s? I don't know, but I did. So I was like, oh, that's that's really tragic and terrible and stuff. And I didn't know Commissioner Gordon had a gun. I was such an idiot. But anyway, um, they did that to give it context. So for people who were stupid like me, <laughs> they would know who this Barbara person is and why it's so significant that she just got shot and uh, paralyzed. Now... So they did this little Batgirl story at the beginning. I mean, the Batgirl story covers like the first 30 minutes of the movie. 
And the big issue that I have with it is that it's, as I say, so tonally different. I mean, as a standalone story, it's not bad. Like, it, it has its moments. But, but honestly, I felt like it really diminished the character of Batgirl. I mean, I was expecting to see uh, a Batgirl story where... Because, I mean, the Barbara Gordon in the original story is, you know, almost middle-aged. She's, like, maybe in her 30s early 40s i mean she's been around the block she's she's almost she's pretty much in semi-retirement as batgirl like she hasn't put on the cape in cal for a while she's kind of you know looking for her own direction working in a library and stuff like that and you know it sets things up later for her to become oracle which is you know where she's the computer whiz who helps out uh, the birds of prey helps out batman helps out you know whoever uh she needs to but um, but that doesn't happen until way later. I mean, at this at this stage in the story, we don't know that the Oracle thing is going to happen. I don't think even DC knew that the Oracle thing was going to happen. Alan Moore just decided to paralyze Barbara Gordon, and then they were you know had to figure out what to do with her. Instead, in the Batgirl story, we get a Batgirl who is still kind of learning to be Batgirl. She's very novice. So it's like she's novice, she's being uh, apprenticed, essentially, by Batman. And, and she's basically, she's reduced to a teenage girl with a crush. You know? It's like she, and it's all about her pining after Batman, rather than just being Batgirl, you know, and, and she's got her her stereotypical gay confidant friend in the library. Uh, I mean, it's you know great to see a gay character getting such screen time, but can we make the character a little less stereotypical, please? You know, like <laughs> I, I know a lot of uh, folks who are of the gay persuasion, and none of them act like that. Absolutely none of them. So. I, I don't know. It's like a gay character written by someone who doesn't know any people who are gay. That's that's kind of how I looked at that. So it just seemed really odd. Like It just didn't fit. You know, it, it was like we, we get novice Batgirl who pines after Batman, seduces him on a rooftop, and then Batman just kind of blows her off for a while. And then uh, she decides to just give it all up. It, that, that, to me, is not the Barbara Gordon that we saw in The Killing Joke. That, to me, is... You know, that, I mean, that, that should not have been a story tagged onto The Killing Joke. I mean, do that as a standalone short or something. Fine. Whatever. We can take it or leave it as its own thing. But tagging it onto the killing joke, I mean, that is not the Barbara Gordon that was in the killing joke. The Barbara Gordon that was in the killing joke was the Barbara Gordon who had been around for a very long time. She'd put away a lot of bad guys. She had a history as Batgirl, and she was done after having established that history. She was just done with it. I mean, you wouldn't be done with it while you're still being tutored, you know? I mean, that just that, that, that's just silly. I mean, that's not the Batgirl that we know. So that's the issues that I had with it. And I, I think really I, I, a lot of the people I see complaining about it are really blowing it out of proportion. They get really ticked off about the fact that she's about the seduction scene. And really, I mean, it's a very brief scene, but still... Just the uh, implication. They're saying, "What well, isn't she supposed to be like 15? It's like, no, actually, in, in this story, she's like in her 20s. But I mean, she's very much an adult. She's not 15. Like, come on, that's ridiculous. Um, in the original story, as I say, she was in like her 30s. So she'd, she'd been around the block. But um, I see people really blowing it out of proportion, saying, oh, you know, this totally shits on the legacy of Batgirl, and Brian Azzarello is just a misogynist and homophobic and blah, blah, and just all this trash, like just toxic, toxic, overblown bullshit. Like, come on, people, get some perspective. Now, I will say this. They obviously knew that not everybody was going to want to watch the backstory. They would just want to watch the adaptation of The Killing Joke. And the Blu-ray gives you that option. You can actually, there's a chapter, Mark, right after the Batgirl story that goes straight into the Killing Joke adaptation. So if you want to skip it, click, click, there, you're into the Killing Joke. So don't worry about it. So as for the adaptation of the Killing Joke, as I said, I think it's perfect. 
uh, it's exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, now I saw some reviewers complaining that the the art style in the uh, like the animation style was not all. Uh, let me see some examples here. It wasn't all like super detailed, like it is in the original comic. You know, well, I mean, just look at the cover. And, and, like, really, folks? Really? So you were expecting to see, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Brian Boland's super hyper-detailed artwork in motion? Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. That That's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. I mean, it, maybe if they'd done it just as a motion comic, then, then you would have seen that. But that would have looked ridiculous. So, I mean, people were complaining that the art style was simplified versus what it is in the comic and it's like of course it is of course it is they've done the same thing in ev like all what 30 plus dc universe animated movies and you're all surprised that they did that with this one too i mean that said i think they did a great job i mean i i went in fully expecting that the artwork would be simplified i mean to go in expecting this level of artwork in animated form is completely ludicrous what planet are you living on? That's not going to happen, ever. Like, ever, okay? So don't even think that that's what it's going to be. And if you're disappointed that it wasn't, well, then you're an idiot, okay? Sorry, but that's the way it is. Uh, you have no perspective as to how animation actually works. You know, I mean, this is hand-drawn 2D animation with some 3D elements to it. And... It's not going to be super hyper detailed moving paintings, you know. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. But um, the thing that I was looking for was, will they have like the the iconic shots from the comic? Like, let me just find a couple of them here. Well, for example, the uh, the opening shot, the rain. It opens with the rain. You you have this exact shot at the beginning. Uh, you know, the, the, the shots of the, it, when he's interrogating who he thinks is the Joker, you know, and he's snapping the cards down and everything, that's all in there. Like, almost shot for shot. It's almost like they use the comic as the storyboard. Uh, the dialogue is bang on. Like, it is perfect. Absolutely perfect dialogue. Uh, now this is really nice. This scene here where he's looking at, uh, uh, he's looking at all the different iterations of the Joker. Now, in the comic here, all of these iterations are from uh, different different uh, ways he's appeared in the comics over the years. In the movie version, they have that, plus they have the ways he's appeared in different movies over the years. So you like, have an animated rendition of the Heath Ledger Joker. You have an animated rendition of the Cesar Romero Joker. You have the Jack Nicholson Joker. You've got... Uh, uh, you got a shot from Death in the Family when he killed Robin, Robin, Robin with a crowbar. Uh, you got all these iconic shots in the Batcave scene when he's looking at the pictures, and, and it's great. It's just a real treat for fans. And then, uh, and then here the the iconic scene where he shows up and shoots Barbara. I mean, it's almost bang on. Pardon the pun there, as you see in the uh, in the comic, and uh, and it's wonderful. Now, I heard that uh, there was a theatrical uh, showing. Oh, here we go. And uh, and this scene where he meets, goes to meet up Barbara with Barbara in the uh, hospital. And she tells him that he's, you know, he's gone over the edge. He's really taking it to the limit this time. And then here where, uh, you know, Commissioner Gordon is being tortured by the mutant baby things. And the Joker's sitting on his uh, throne of, uh, you know, I guess it's like baby dolls or something. Yeah, it's like a whole stack of baby dolls. And uh, that where he says, you're going mad. That that exact shot is in the movie when he says that exact line. I mean, it's all in there, man. Uh, let me just skip ahead a little ways. Um, oh, yeah, th this whole sequence where he uh, where he's taking uh, Commissioner Gordon through the carnival ride, showing him all the pictures he took of Barbara, naked and uh, bloodied. And uh, while he's doing a musical number. Now, I heard that there was a theatrical showing of this, and people were walking out during the musical number. Like, they were just done. Like, they just couldn't take it. Um, again, probably not familiar with the comic, because the musical number is straight out of the comic. All they did was set it to music in the uh, thing. I mean, the whole idea is that it's juxtaposing this ridiculous, stupid song 
with this absolute horror that he's putting the commissioner through. I mean, he's he's forcing the commissioner to look at pictures of his daughter naked and uh, horribly, horribly injured. I mean, that is sick, sick stuff. But that's that's the Joker, man. That's the shit that the Joker does. And then uh, let's see what else is it? Yeah. Oh yeah, this shot here, where uh, we get we get the whole flashback of the origin story and when he first becomes the Joker. This this whole sequence here is in the movie shot for shot. Like, it is exactly as you see it here. So, um, I should say, one one minor niggle I have with it is uh, I, I got the impression that this was a little bit more of a build-up to absolute screaming laughter for the last part. And uh, I don't know if this is the director's decision or Mark Hamill's decision, but uh, it's not quite as over-the-top, like, in terms of the laughing, as I, as I was kind of expecting it to be. Um, not really a complaint, just kind of a, a, a little bit uh, minorly disappointed by the performance there, just because I thought it would be a little more over. The, it should have been a little more over the top. But that said, you still get the sense of his mind cracking <laughs> at that moment. I mean, it's still beautifully played. It's just not as over the top as I felt that it should have been. Um, and then you got all these other wonderful iconic shots. You know, the Batmobile and the Joker, and it's just. I mean, the artwork in this comic is absolutely beautiful, and honestly, I think they really did it justice. Um, so, it's just the Batgirl story that, that throws things off. So, honestly, going forward, whenever I watch this, I will be skipping the Batgirl story, most likely, and just watching the Killing Joke part of it. Because the Killing Joke part of it is fantastic. And I think that's it's unfortunate that they went in the direction they did with the Batgirl story, because I think it, it, it lessens the overall product. And people focus too much on the Batgirl story to the point where they, are, they, they aren't appreciating the 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 part that you know they should be appreciating <laughs> the part that is actually good and they did a good job of i mean the thing is with with all the dc universe movies that i've watched um the ones that have been direct adaptations of, of iconic stories and most of them have been uh there's been a few original ones but uh, for the most part they've been adaptations of notable stories or story arcs um, they've been very faithful to the source material. I mean, they've hit all the right beats, and they it really feels like those iconic stories brought to life. Um, you know, when I did my review of All-Star Superman a while back, um, you might want to check that out, uh, where I read the comic first and then uh, checked out the movie and just took note of some of the differences and such. And uh, that one, I mean, it would have been nice if they'd done that one as a two-parter, honestly, because they'd cut out a hell of a lot. But uh, in this case... It's a 48-page graphic novel, and, uh, you know, uh, pretty much every single word, every single panel of it is in the movie. Like, I mean, you cannot possibly have a more thorough adaptation. Um, I just wish they'd done a different kind of Batgirl story. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I don't know what to tell you. Um... Did I like the Batgirl story? I liked aspects of it, to be honest. I mean, as a standalone Batgirl story, it's okay. It has its moments. You know, she does get to kick butt in a few parts. And it does show uh, her struggle with just the whole sort of crime-fighting lifestyle. And I like that aspect of it. Um, I think the whole pining after Batman thing, though, was just silly and unnecessary. Now, I know that they're, they, they've talked about this before. And they're, been, uh, they're basically calling back to things that have been in the comics over the years and that have been alluded to in the comics over the years and they just kind of ran with that um so it was just a basically a creative decision to go with those things that have happened over the years but um i i don't know i just i, I just didn't like it <laughs> simply put but the killing joke part of it i really liked a lot and i will be watching that part of it over and over and over again so it it's it's kind of a mixed recommendation. I mean, you, you may or may not like the Batgirl story. I mean, I know some people who, who liked it. I mean, uh, it, it's entirely a matter of personal preference. It, it really just matters, uh, you know, uh, how much certain aspects of it are going to bother you. Like, if I guess how sacred the Batgirl character is to you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. But uh, at the very least, even if you don't like the Batgirl story, I urge you to give the killing joke portion of it a chance because I honestly think they did a fantastic job adapting it 
and that part of it is everything that I wanted the adaptation to be, and I think they did a great job of it. And uh, those who are complaining about that part of it, either A, have never read the comics, so they don't know what the hell they're talking about, or B, had unrealistic expectations for the animation style, uh, or C, just have no taste, goddammit, because it's a great fucking story. All right. <laughs> That is it for me to you for now. Sorry again, this was late. Hope it was appropriately lengthy and made up for it a little bit. So, uh, yeah. So, lots more comic book stuff to come in the Wednesdays ahead. So, we'll see you then. Quick thank you to my Patreon sponsors, especially Kyle Pellegrin and Get Your Gorgeous On, my two highest level sponsors. Thanks very much, guys. And we'll see you next time. So, until then, thanks for watching and sayonara.